after the war, there was a lot of concerns, um, economic concerns for sure. Uh, the fear that uh, the United States would sink right back into that Great Depression. Um, as I said before, one solution to that would be the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, also known as the GI Bill, passed uh, that would allow returning soldiers uh, who, who served in World War II to receive either low cost loans to open up businesses or uh, free ride, uh, full ride scholarships to college. So uh, the education level would increase in the United States and it would keep those soldiers out of job hunting market so that there wouldn't be that uh, huge amount of, of uh, unemployment like there was before the war during the Great Depression. Uh, so remember the government went into uh, full on uh, wartime, a wartime economy where they're spending like crazy. As I said earlier, that the, the sky wasn't necessarily falling. And, uh, you know, they, they were comfortable continuing to spend and spend they did. Congress uh, passed the Taft-Hartley Act, which outlawed the closed shop, and uh, meaning that uh, it, was a, it was taking a shot at labor unions. Remember, labor unions grew during the uh, New Deal because of the NRA first and the NIRA, National Industrial Recovery Act, also known as the Wagner Act, that gave more rights to workers. And now... Uh, you're going to get it all over again. You know, history ha happens in waves back and forth. Uh, big business is going to step up and say, if you're a member of a union, you're a commie. So this is, you know, during Red Scare too. So they're using that same trick that they did, did before and that they're um, trying to link unionism and communism. Okay, let's talk about the Korean War. The, the Korean War is going to become the first confrontation in the Cold War. It's not going to directly um, directly involve uh, Russia versus the United States, but indirectly, definitely, yes. It was uh, June 25th, 1950. The North Koreans for, invaded the South Koreans. Um, and, 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 you know, they came across the 38th parallel line and they attacked. North Korea was communist. South Korea was Democrat. And, uh, you know, the North Koreans wanted to clear all of Korea of the democratic government, and they wanted to institute their own um, communism all throughout. So Truman then sprang to action and, and you know, said, hey, we're not going to do what we did after, or, uh, after World War I and just, you know, play the isolationist game. So he was going to be really uh, forceful. And he's going to intervene. And I didn't want this to be like it was uh, with the League of Nations. And the U.S. immediately demanded uh, the, that the, they jump up. Their, well, the National Security uh, Council met and decided they're going to bump up their spending. They quadrupled spending for military purposes. And it's called NSC 68, National Security Council memorandum number 68 to quadruple spending on the military preparing for this war and uh, and then it, it went to the united nations now remember the united nations is made up of the security council um plus the general assembly and the security the, the war you know there's a there was a, a a memorandum out there or um you know, a proposal that they would go go to war and stop the North, North Koreans from invading the South. And it was unanimously approved by the General Assembly. Um, you know, and, it, and it's, it, it's hard to believe that that realistically happened. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, the Security Council, not the General Assembly, because the USSR and China are both permanent members and they have veto power. They could have said no, and war wouldn't have happened. Um, not sure exactly how that went down or what kind of negotiations went on, but uh, war was approved. The UN forces that were going to go in and try to stop the um, North Koreans were led by American General Douglas MacArthur. Four-fifths of the troops that were fighting in Korea were American troops. 
United Nation troops were supposed to be a collection of soldiers from all the member countries. But four fifths of them, as it turned out, were American and they were led by Douglas MacArthur, an American general. Um, general MacArthur landed an invasion behind enemy li lines on September 15, 1950, and, and uh, drove the uh, North Koreans back across the 38th parallel. So here's stage one right here. You could see uh, stage one being the North Koreans crossing the 38th parallel here and invading South Korea. Um, and then it says here, as MacArthur, Biography, Clayton, James described it, North Korean artillery and mortar barrages began hitting South Korean positions along the 150 mile width of the peninsula, shortly uh, followed by an invasion forces totaling over 90,000 troops, 150 Soviet built tanks that struck in smoothly coordinated assaults. All right, so the uh, Soviets are indirectly helping out with military might. Here's stage two. By the end of July, the North Koreans had pushed the UN forces to the southeast corner of the peninsula where they dug in around the port of Pusan, which is right here. So they had, North Koreans came down across the 38th and pushed all the way to the port of Busan. Over the next six weeks, a desperate bloody struggle ensued as the North Koreans threw everything they had at the American and South Korean forces in an effort to gain complete control of, of Korea. They figured if they beat them all the way to the ocean, that they would then win. Stage three, this is the invasion by MacArthur. Uh, MacArthur completely changed the co course of the war overnight by ordering over nearly unanimous objections an amphibious invasion at the port of Incheon located right here. So they're coming in behind enemy lines. The Americans quickly gained the control of Incheon and recaptured Seoul within days and cut the North Korean supply lines. American and South Korean forces broke out of the Busan perimeter and chased the retreating army north. So they came around, they attacked here, they fought, and then they chased them back this way. Um, and then MacArthur received permission to pursue the enemy into North Korea. So the, the goal for MacArthur was now that they had basically the North Koreans on skates going backwards, they wanted to not only push them past the 38th, but push them the opposite way. So now the Americans and South Korean forces became the aggressor. They wanted to, to clear all of, of Korea of the communists. That was their goal. Stage four, despite warnings from the communist China, right up here, uh, through an Indian diplomat that American intrusion into North Korea would encounter Chinese resistance. MacArthur forces continued to push north. The Chinese army, which had been massing north of the Yalu River after secretly slipping into Korea, struck with considerable force. So the Chinese said, if a single soldier crosses the Yalu River, they would get involved. And that's going to happen. China is, is going to get involved. MacArthur was now worried enough to press Washington for greater latitude in taking the fight into China. So he wanted to push all the way past the Yalu into China. Now the Chinese get involved. So it's the combination of the Chinese and the North Korean forces, and they're going to push back the other way. MacArthur's all-out offensive to the Yalu had barely begun when the Chinese struck with awesome force on the night of November 25th. MacArthur's men fought courageously and skillfully just to avoid annihilation as they were pushed back down the peninsula. So the China, with the Chinese help, they pushed him back to the 38th. There was a stalemate at the 38th parallel. General MacArthur had been steadily pushing Washington to remove the restrictions on his forces, but not only did Truman decline for fear of widening the war, but he fired MacArthur, who had been publicly challenging him for months for insubordination on April 11th. So MacArthur, who was bold, was pushing for the use of nuclear weapons in China to stop the Chinese so they could so the Americans and South Koreans could push all the way through North Korea. And uh, Truman said no. So MacArthur kept talking behind his back and saying negative things. And uh, Truman then fired Douglas MacArthur for insubordination. The 38th parallel uh, was, after all three years of fighting, the 38th parallel was reestablished. So they're right back where they were three years before. And still to this day, North Korea and South Korea are separated by the 38th parallel.
Okay, so you know, with all the people freaking out here about communism, this is Red Scare Two. Uh, Red Scare Two, as I've said earlier in the year, is more intense than Red Scare One because you've got nuclear weapons involved, and and nobody was immune to suspicion. Athletes, actors, singers, teachers. Uh, anybody, you know, business, business people, anybody who had influence over other people could be held accountable and be put in jail for um, being communist. The rule of thumb is this. It's not, you can't take away your right to be communist. It's, it's a right granted in the constitution. But if you have influence over people, um, it's illegal for you to be communist and you could be put in jail. There was a loyalty review board. Uh, created by the government, by Congress, 3 million federal employees were investigated for being communist with no, mostly no evidence. In 1949, 11 communists were brought to New York for a jury for violating the Smith Act of 1940, which had been the first peacetime anti-sedition law since 1798, the Alien Sedition Act. So the Smith Act, you know, if you, you is it, it was a anti-sedition law. Truman vetoed the McCarran inter internal security bill, which let the president arrest and detain suspicious people during an internal security emergency. It passed over his veto. So this law, the McCarran internal security bill, would give the president more power to detain suspicious people. Uh, but he felt it was overstepping his bounds and was taking rights away from people. So he vetoed it. And Congress said, nope, you're not going to veto that law. So he vetoed a bill that would have given him more power. But Congress said, no, you're not going to veto it. So he did end up getting the power. He didn't use it. Uh, the uh, Congress also created HUAC, House Un-American Activities Committee, led by future president Richard Nixon. HUAC. HUAC would uh, put people on trial, whether they're actors, singers, athletes. And uh, the first question that they would be asked, and, most, and a lot of times it was on TV, because the TV starts coming around here during this time, was, are you currently or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And you had to answer yes or no. Um, so here's a political cartoon. It says, it's okay, we're hunting communists. So here you've got, uh, it says, uh, Committee on Un-American Activities, HUAC, House of Un-American Activities Committee. They're driving through the streets and running over people. And it says, it's okay that we're running over these people because we're hunting for communists. So that became the thing, right, for would be uh, an excuse that people would use as we're trying to hunt out communists. Lies were ruined. Reputations were ruined. Businesses went under uh, when, when people would be accused, mostly falsely, for being communist. Spying, you know, when it comes to nuclear weapons and, and uh, you know, giving uh, secrets to the Soviets, they knew that this was happening. They just had to find out who was doing it. Uh, the first two, and the, probably the most well-known, are the Rosenbergs, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. They, brought, they were brought to trial, convicted, and executed uh, for selling secrets to the Soviets. Theirs was the first execution of civilians for espionage in the in United States history. Their sensational trial, electrocution, and sympathy for their two children began to sober American zeal and red, red hunting. So whatever it was, the fact that, you know, there was a lot of sympathy for the two kids that were left behind that were Julius and Ethel, Ethel Rosenberg's kids, people started to get um, sympathetic to it and said, are we going a little bit overboard here? Could they have been put in jail for a really long time? Did they have to be killed? It says here, uh, Morton Sobel, who was tried with the Rosenberg served 17 years and nine months. In 2008, Sobel admitted he was a spy and confirmed Julius Rosenberg was in a conspiracy that delivered to the Soviets classified military and industrial information and what the American government described as the secret to the atomic bomb. So they were guilty, but Americans began to be concerned because they thought they were, by killing them, it was taking, them, taking it a step too far. Alger Hiss, who was a well-known politician, uh, he served under FDR, part of the New Deal, one of the authors of the New Deal. He was uh, formerly a high official in the U.S. Department of Justice, denies charges that he engaged in espionage in 1948 in testimony before HUAC. 
um, Whitaker Chambers accused uh, Hiss of transmitting secret government information to the Soviets. Although Hiss denied the charges, he was convicted of perjury, lying under oath, and sentenced to a five-year prison term. This is the guy most associated with the Red Scare too, Joseph McCarthy, who was a senator from Wisconsin. Um, just as we talk about Red Scare One and people like A. Mitchell Palmer, um, he was, he's the guy most identified with Red Scare One. It's Joseph McCarthy, who's uh, <clears throat> more known for Red, Red Scare Two. Uh, Joseph McCarthy charged that there were scores of unknown communists in the State Department. He couldn't prove it, and many Americans began to fear that the red chasing was going too far. Um, he, will, he will be one of the biggest drama guys in American history, very, very dramatic uh, claim that the State Department and the United States Army was riddled with communists. And, they, and he put hundreds of these men on trial. It was all public. It was on TV. And it was the TV that eventually brought this guy down. Uh, people saw what an idiot he really was. Um, he was an alcoholic. Um, he, he died of cirrhosis of the liver at a pretty young age. Um, he, he, he took it way too far, no doubt. We'll talk about him more in the next chapter. <clears throat> okay, the GI Bill, talk a little bit about that. The uh, full ride scholarship bill. See here, the signing of the uh, GI Bill. North Car Carolina State, there's, an, there's a, an ad for North Carolina State that we're accepting uh, GI Bill servicemen. The election of, of 1948. So Harry Truman, who became president because of the death of FDR, now is running for president for the first time. He's going against a man by the name of Thomas Dewey. Um, the, uh, really, the Southerners did not like Harry Truman. Harry Truman was, was pretty vocal about coming out and saying that he wanted to help African-Americans in the South. And he, he threw his support to the African-Americans which the racist people in the Democrat party didn't like. So they created their own party, very reminiscent of what happened in 1860 when the uh, Democrats split into two, the Northern Democrats and the Southern Democrats. You're having the same thing is happening here. And it looked like it was gonna be the same result of 1860 that the split in the party would give the uh, victory to Thomas Dewey. Uh, the Dixiecrats uh, nominated Strom Thurmond, who died about 10 years ago. He was a racist. Uh, he changed his ways and was able to continue in, in uh, Congress up until his death about 10 years ago. Uh, there was another, uh, you throw someone else in the mix too, the Progressive Party led by former Vice President Harry Wallace. And, it's, and it looks very similar to 1860, where you had the Compromise Party um, under John Bell, that it was all about compromise. Uh, so you, you, it's just very similar. And it looked for all intents and purposes like Dewey was gonna win this election. As a matter of fact, when, uh, when everybody went to bed that, the night of the election, uh, people were pretty sure that um, the victory was gonna go to Dewey. And even the newspapers printed out this very famous picture right here of uh, Truman holding up a newspaper that says Dewey defeats Truman. And that's not what happened. Everybody woke up the next morning and Truman did well in the West and ended up pulling out a victory uh, from the fangs of defeat. It looked for all intents and purposes like he was going to lose. That Chicago Daily Tribune said as much. So well-known picture. So there's your, there's your victory, right? You know, all this West, the, the Reds going, uh, the Red States here. Red today is Republican, but that's not what this map is showing you. But uh, the Democrats end up winning here. Truman wins in his own right. So here's the deal and why a lot of Southerners didn't like him. Um, Tr Truman named his policy the fair deal, right? He, he took over for Roosevelt, who had the new deal. He, he calls his economic policy the fair deal. And basically what it is is the new deal plus civil rights. All right, why wouldn't you want to continue on with the New Deal? I mean, the previous president was elected to four terms. He was popular, no doubt. He helped get the country out of the Depression. So why wouldn't you want to continue on with the New Deal? But his twist was adding 
civil rights to it, right? That's what he wanted to do. New Deal. So whenever you think of Fair Deal, it's New Deal plus civil rights. And it, it, he called it his point four program. The fourth point in his inauguration speech was to spend more money on underdeveloped countries to keep communism out. So continue to spend his point four program. Just keep spending boatloads of money to countries so they won't go communist. Okay, so uh, man, 1950 uh, to 1970 was the longest economic boom in American history. The permanent wartime economy is incredibly stimulating the economy. The middle class more than doubled during this time, while uh, now people wanted not one car, but two. Because of the growth of the suburbs, dad would go to work in, in the city, mom would stay home and have to shuttle the kids here and there. So two cars were and it, it, for every household was the desire. Nine, over 90% of American families owned uh, television during that 20 year per period. Women also reaped the benefits of the post-war economy growing in the American workforce. And uh, you know, a lot of the prosperity of the 50s and 60s was built on the colossal military projects, right? nuclear weapons, the amount of money that was being thrown around the amount of jobs that were created to build these nuclear weapons was stimulating the economy tremendously. We had that permanent wartime economy going. So yeah, let's talk about the car in, in the 50s. You know, you had things like drive-in movies right here. You had now hotels, more and more hotels, ch hotel chains that were sprouting up because so many people were traveling now because of the car was, was so efficient and good. And then First McDonald's in 1955. You can uh, you had a drive drive up window and you can go through the drive through. There's what the cars of the 1950s look like. Pretty cool. Once again, another similarity between post World War One and post World War Two. A similarity between the 20s and the 50s was the consumerism that happened. Right. It's it's now obviously you know 30 years later. And, and the products are getting, the technology is getting much, much better. Here's a, a quote from Life Magazine. It says, all babies were potential, were, were potential consumers who spearheaded a brand new market for food, clothing, and shelter. And of course, you have that baby boom generation going strong. So here's some examples of the consumerism, the TVs, the clothes, the radio. There's what your TVs look like, 21 inch. That was a huge big screen TV back then. A lot of the TVs were like tiny like that, but a big 12 inch picture right there. Imagine that. Okay, so let's talk about movement of people, the migration of people. Um, you know, there was this big move to movement to go down to the South, searching for lower taxes and better weather. And that movement is still going on to this day the smiling sun belt. People are moving to the South. Um, they're getting out of the cold rust belt, moving into the sun belt. So here's what they, why they call it the smiling sun belt, because it starts here up in California and goes all the way, sorry, goes all the way across the country to here. So it looks like a big smile, the smiling sun belt. And people are moving down in this area. They're moving out of the rust belt states up here the Ohio's and Illinois and Michigan and New York and those places. And they're moving down again, searching for lower taxes, more jobs and better weather because so many people were moving. And because there were so many kids, people like Dr. Benjamin Spock, who wrote a book uh, about child rearing became really popular. Um, he sold a tremendous amount of books and became rich now, back then, let's say you moved from New York to Florida, your parents might still live up in New York or, you know, you move, people are moving around, they're moving away from family. And uh, it was very expensive to call people on the phone. It was long, you had to pay long distance. It's not like today where you can call anywhere with your cell phone. Long distance was very expensive and people were, you know, reluctant to spend that much money doing that. So, you know, kids were born. Uh, to young parents who didn't know what to do with this new child. So they had to go to a book instead of asking mom or dad, because mom and dad 
lived thousands of miles away and it was too expensive to call. So you needed a book right there so you could, you know, find out how to rear these children. So it's a combination of movement of people and baby boom generation made Dr. Benjamin Spock um, very popular and made a lot of money off the sale of his books. So with this now, with all the, with the cars and, and uh, the amount of money that's being low cost loans that people could take advantage of from the United States government as a uh, part of the GI bill, you're starting to see more and more uh, suburbs popping up. People are wanting to move away from the inner city out to the suburbs. And this is, a, 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 uh, this is the beginning of what's called white flight. White people were able to take advantage of the low cost loans. African-Americans were forbidden from being able to have access to these low cost loans. So they were not able to move out to the suburbs. Though what you had left in the inner city was predominantly African-American where whites were moving to the suburbs. That's why they call it white flight. Um, innovators like the Levitt brothers were, were uh, building these houses uh, at places like New York and Pennsylvania. Uh, there was a construction building boom in the 1950s. So uh, suburban living was really, um, you really saw it on TV, uh, really reflected in these TV shows. Not sure anybody out there really knows anything about these, but the Donna Reed show, Father Knows Best, the Ozzie and Harriet show, and then Leave it to Beaver. Maybe some of you have heard about that or the new Leave it to Beaver. It depicted life in the 1950s, family values, dad goes to work, mom stays home and cooks and cleans, and the teenagers or young kids are around. They're doing their homework. They're waking up early. Everybody's having a nice big breakfast with pancakes and and uh, everybody's sitting around the table. Everybody's sitting around the table at dinner. Uh, it, the, it really, um, the conformity of the 1950s, they call it. Was it really happening everywhere? No, it was not. Was it happening in a lot of places? Yes, it was. Um, predominantly white people in the suburbs were experiencing some of this. So the conformity of the 1950s. This, these two pictures right here, kind of, kind of uh, opposites, right? You've got, the, the, you, it, it really shows you what's going on here. So first of all, you've got people working on the docks and you have women in there too. So women had the opportunity to stay in their jobs if they wanted to. Most of them did not. Most of them went home and had kids. So here's, you have a lot of men that most of these men probably took advantage of the GI Bill and went and got their education. And moms are having kids and there's all the young kids. It depicts life in the 1950s, baby boom generation, GI Bill, you know, uh, increase in education levels in the United States. Probably more of this was going on than this. A lot of women didn't stay and work um, in factories. Okay, so I, I mentioned Levitt Towns. Here's examples of Levitt Towns. All right, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Levitt Town. They're, you know, prefab houses. Um, they Everything looks the same. Um, but it was out in the suburbs and you had tons of kids out there in the neighborhoods and Levitt towns. All right, so I, I've been mentioning the baby boom. It says here, many soldiers returned after the war then had babies creating this baby boom generation. Um, they're putting strain, they put a strain on the system where every step of the way, right? So in the 1950s, it was toys and diapers and baby food. In the in the uh, '60s, they were teenagers, and they were they are the hippie generation. So, if you think 1960s hippies, tie dye, uh, make love, not war, um, rock and roll, you know uh, Woodstock, you you would think of that, that. Those are the that's the baby boom generation growing up. And then the '70s, they entered the job market. In the '80s, they were called the yuppies. And then currently now. They're the ones draining the money out of social security. They're the elderly people. They are in their seventies right now, uh, late sixties, all the way up until late seventies. So here they are, school children in the fifties, teenagers in the sixties, yuppies in the eighties, elderlies in the two thousands. It says here, it seems that to me that every young, other young housewife I see is pregnant. They see the, the baby boom generation here. You know, you look at, 
1945, here's here, this big boom right here in the birth of kids. In 1957, one baby was born every seven seconds. And that's the end of chapter 35.